Happy Sabbath. How's everyone today? Um, if you need a lesson, there's one at the back of the room. And in the bulletin, it says Lesson 7, but it's really Lesson 8. <laughs> lesson 7 was last week. Um, and before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we come before Thee on Your Holy Sabbath day. Please, Lord, we would ask for a blessing. Especially, we ask for your presence to be with us, to lead us and guide us as we search for truth in your word. Please, Lord, we not only ask for to know the truth, but that you will give us strength to follow it. We ask this most humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week in the bulletin, it says, Jesus desired their good. And since we weren't together last Sabbath, um, I want to talk a little bit about how Jesus desired their good. What does that sound like? Um, have you got any ideas about how Jesus desired their good? Did he desire them to be good? Is that what that means? He desired for them to be good? Or did he desire for them to have good? Um, that their good came before anything that he wanted. He desired the very best. Not only for the people of his time, but for the people before him. His appearing... The, his first advent and for the people who came after before his second advent Jesus desires the best for us his father desires the best for us for he sent his only begotten son to us he sent all of heaven he sent the very best he had been reading a little bit about sacrifices and how um, Israel became so caught up in the ceremony in the, of the sacrifice and it was more like oh I just got to get over there and sacrifice this lamb and everything will be okay and, and they would just uh, the scriptures say that they would give not their best not some lamb that they had uh, picked out because he was strong and no blemish was on him. They would give the lame and the blind as sacrifices because they were holding out the very best for themselves. And that displeased God. God said that was an abomination and that displeased him greatly that they would not give their best. There's a hymn in the, in the uh, hymnal I uh, know you've heard it many times. Uh, give of your best to the master. Well, the master has given everything. Our Father in heaven gave the absolute best. And Jesus, when he was here on earth, he gave so that you would have the best. He was the best teacher, he has the best stories. He, his spirit inspired all the writers of the Old Testament, the scriptures of his day. And he gave the best translation of everything that they did. For he was the inspiration to them. So Jesus not only wants us to be our best, but he gives to us so that he gives us the best. And then he tells us that we should turn and give, want the best for our brothers and sisters and for our neighbors and for the people we work with and for the people we drive down the road with. 
we should want to give them the gap in front of us. We should want to make sure they get home safely. We should want the best for them. That was last Sabbath. That was last week. And I told Doug, I said, whoops, I've studied the wrong lesson. But maybe I didn't. All things work together for good. So this week is Sabbath school lesson number eight. And it's Jesus mingled with the people. How many here have ever gone to a party? Yeah, we like, I like parties. Parties um, can be the baby's first birthday. It can be graduation. It can be a marriage, having a baby. We always have a party. We have a party for all these events, don't we? We have them called wedding showers, baby showers, receptions. And when you're at a party, some people walk around and talk to everybody. They, they call that mingling. You know, you walk around, you talk, you sit down at this table and you talk to all the fat family and those folks. And then you go over and you talk to all these other people. Or you're a wallflower. And you sit there and look at everybody. And everybody looks at you, but sooner or later they aren't talking to you because you're not talking to them. Mingling at a party uh, is one thing. How about mingling to share the gospel? So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Memory verse comes out of Luke 15 and Verses 1 and 2. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. They drew near to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Because these people... They, they, they were in open sin. Um, ooh, publicans were the worst things. They were tax collectors, and nobody liked publicans because they always kind of added a little extra, so they made sure that they got paid a little bit of more money for the reproach that they were getting from their own people. And that way they not only cheated their own people, but they cheated the government too. And that kind of wasn't so bad, cheating the government, but the other people their own folks didn't like that very much. And um, Do you remember the story of that Jesus told about two men in the synagogue praying? One was a Pharisee, and he said, lifted up his head, and he said, Lord, I am so thankful. I pay my tithe. I... I uh, fast twice a week and I am so glad I'm not like that publican over there. And the publican was in the corner and he was beating on his chest and he was saying, oh Lord, I don't see how you can love me but I wish you would. I am such a sinner and I need you. And Jesus said, one of these men one of these men's prayer was heard in heaven and the other one was not. Everybody's thinking, well, of course, the good guy, he's pretty righteous. He, he fasts and he pays tithe. And that old publican over there, I know he's even stolen from me. But actually, one was self-satisfied and the other one needed help. So here we have... Jesus eating with publicans and sinners. Here we are, living in the midst of an epidemic of crime. 
at which thoughtful, God-fearing men everywhere stand aghast. The corruption that prevails, it is beyond the power of the human pen to describe. Every day brings fresh revelations of political strife, bribery, and fraud. Every day brings its heart-sickening record of violence, lawlessness, of indifference to human suffering, a brutal, fiendish destruction of human life. Every day testifies to the increase of insanity, murder, and suicide. Who can doubt that satanic agencies are at work among men with increasing activity to distract and corrupt the mind and defile and destroy the body? It's Ministry of Healing. Written back in 1905. Thursday night. My, my sister said that her daughter and son-in-law and her three grandsons came in very, very late. They came down to visit and they came in after midnight. And they were all in a dither. Something's going on over at Miss Dot's house. Something's going over there bad. The fire trucks are all over there. The police are all over there. There's a helicopter landing in her yard. Something's wrong with Miss Dot. So they all, David got up and he went over to find out what was going on. Poor Miss Dot. She's a sweet lady. She's been there a long time. Have a real nice farm. It's kind of off the road. And they grow well, her husband passed away, and she grows blueberries and strawberries and has a U-Pick farm. But something bad was going on. Horrible. David came back. He was so upset. Lynn said, Miss Doc got broken in on. They beat her up really bad. They broke both of her arms, and then they poured stuff on her and lit her on fire. They burned her. I was like, are you kidding? People just don't do that. I mean, this is a little bitty rural town down in Merriweather County. Who would do something awful like that to an 83-year-old lady who grows berries and sells them? Everywhere there are hearts crying out for something which they have not. They long for a power that will give them mastery over sin. A power that will deliver them from the bondage of evil. A power that will give health and life and peace. Many who once knew the power of God's word have dealt where there is no recognition of God. And now they long for the divine presence. Why are people acting so ugly to each other? Why? Do they not know that Jesus is coming? Do they not care? Have they just lost their way or have they just lost their minds? The true light which liveth in every man cometh into the world. Who is that? Jesus. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. How in the world can we be Christians How do we deal with a situation where people break into someone else's home and they do this horrific thing? And what would our first reaction is always to the victim, which is a victim. It is true. We pray, we've had lots of prayer for Miss Doc, and we hope and pray she will recover. Third degree burns, broken hand, broken arms. Lord, be with her and her family. But dear Lord, please be with these people who did this horrific thing. 
they are lost. They are very lost. And Jesus died for them. On Monday's lesson, on Monday's lesson, we talk about the lost and found. How would you go about finding the lost? I think the first thing you have to know is what's lost? Lost and found. Luke 15, 3 through 7. And he, Jesus, spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he has found it, he puts it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors and saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Did the, lamb, did the sheep know that it was lost? Pretty much so. Bah, bleedingly. Bah, I'm lost. I don't know where I am. I don't know how to get myself found again. Do we know people who are that way? Don't know how to get themselves found again? I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Now is Jesus happy with when we are in his fold, when we are in his flock, when we follow his word, when he is our shepherd and we are his sheep? Is he not just happy for that? Yes, he is. How about for the people who don't think they need repentance? That think they've already got it. That feel as though they are just and in need of nothing. Rich and increased with goods. Are they not just as lost as the sheep that's out on the mountain? If we realize in a deeper sense the love of God for sinners... Much more would be done in the name of Christ to seek and to save that which was lost. The parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the prodigal son bring out in distinct lines God's pitying love for those who are erring and straying from him. Although following their own course of action and turning away from God, he does not leave them in their misery. The Lord is full of loving kindness and tender pitying love to all who ex are exposed to the temptations of the artful foe. These people who broke in on this stop, wherever they are, the Lord is full of loving kindness toward them. Ooh, that's hard for me. I really want to take out my gun and unload it on them. Because that's my kind of justice. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but leadeth to destruction. Do you not see that that would destroy lives? Not that I wouldn't consider it. Satan fell from his high position through self-exaltation. He misused the high capabilities with which God had so richly endowed him. He fell for the same reason that thousands are falling today. Because of an ambition to be first. An unwillingness to be under restraint. If you do not learn at a young age how to discipline yourself and have self-discipline. As you get older... There will be discipline for you. It's called incarceration. It happens. 
people get a gun, they go to the bank, they want money, they need money, and they commit a crime. Jesus came to seek that which was lost. And Jesus used the parable of the lost sheep to teach a lesson to the hard-hearted scribes and Pharisees. Are we hard-hearted scribes and Pharisees? I'm afraid we may fall into that category. Jesus came to seek that and to save that which was lost, but they the leaders of the church, his Christian people, found fault with him for receiving sinners and eating with them, for going to their party. Jesus did not rebuke them openly. He did not rebuke the Pharisees openly, lest he should close the door of their hearts against him. But he gave them a symbol which they could carry with them and through which some would be convicted. Now there's Luke 15, 8 through 10. He talks about either that woman which having ten pieces of silver, if she loses one piece, does she not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently until she find it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends or neighbors together and saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. By the parable of the lost silver, Christ sought to impress upon the minds of his hearers the necessity of arousing the sensibilities of those within the home or the house of God to seek for those who were straying from God. Not one member of the family is to be forgotten. The one wayward child is to be sought for. The candle, the word of God, is to be lighted and diligently used in examining everything in the house to see why this one child is lost to God. That is a... That is a... a rev, that's, that's for... Re, revival. Revival in the church is necessary. Good revivals are necessary for us. A good house cleaning is necessary. Sometimes you have to know what the kids are doing in their bedroom. The Lord works with those who are sinners. These are the ones who need most of the help of the great physician. Yet like the lost piece of silver, they are unconscious of their state. They don't realize that they're lost. Then we go to verse 11. And Jesus, he said, a certain man had two sons. Ah, the prodigal son story. Really, Daddy, I want you to die so I can go ahead and have my money. I want my inheritance now. I don't want to stay here. I don't want to live by your rules. I don't want to live by his rules. I don't want to live here anymore. I want my inheritance so I can do what I want to do. Oh, how many of us have lived that one out? And his father gave it to him. Did you know that God gives us the desires of our hearts, whether they be righteous desires that he gave us, or whether they are evil, wicked desires that Satan has talked to us about, tempted us for? He gives us the desires of our hearts. Do not blame God for a bad choice that you have made. If you left him out of the choice situation before, get down on your knees and ask him for his help now because all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. Love the Lord. Oh, there's a first step. The parable of the prodigal son is presented before us as the Lord's dealing with those who have once known the Father's love, 
but who have allowed the tempter to lead them captive at his will. The love of God is still strong for the one who has chosen to separate from him. I just couldn't. You know, I have a big family. I was an only child for a long time, until I was nine years old. And then we got my sister, the one I was telling you about whose neighbor was Miss Dot. I love my sister. But when I was younger, we were sisters, truly. Because sometimes she breathed my air, and I didn't like that at all. She actually took up some space of mine. <clears throat> I actually had to share my parents with her, my friends, my room, my clothes, you know, my space. Lynn, I love you. <laughs> so thankful for her she's a good girl she's a good daughter she never once gave me a lecture on anything although I needed it <laughs> she was patient the Lord worked with her for me who had everything. I had a mom and daddy. I had toys. I had family. I had a swimming pool my parents had provided. Bicycles. I did. And Lynn, she was from a very broken, tangled up, messy, abusive, family but she saved me in this parable Christ shows us that any class of sinners who will return to God he will receive with joy and cover him with a robe of righteousness So you're eating with sinners. Now, you know, you can look at this a lot of different ways. You're eating with sinners. Does that mean you actually go to their house and sit down with sinners and, and eat dinner with them? Could be. What about the breaking bread with sinners? And what about going to church or looking at or being with other people who are not of our particular denomination or of not our particular train of thought theology speaking what about breaking the bread with them this being the word of God that came down from heaven became flesh with us that's why Jesus told them, you've got to eat my body. You've got to drink my blood. And they went away going, this is a hard thing. That is so offensive. That is really offensive. They did not gain the understanding from thousands of years of doing a sacrifice. A particular kind of sacrifice. They did not learn what it meant. Thousands of years of doing it. And doing it the wrong way? Is that possible? So Jesus tells him, hey, let's go over to uh, Matthew 9. We're on Tuesday's lesson. In Matthew 9, and Jesus says something to them that's straight out of the book of the Old Testament. See if this is where it is. Nine ten, verse ten. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. 
And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, they didn't say it to regularly to Jesus. They went behind his back. They're going to talk to his disciples. They're going to plant a seed of what? Prejudice. Here goes. Why eat your, why eat your master with publicans and sinners? It's almost like, does he know better? Why is he doing this? But when Jesus heard that, he said to them, They that be holy, not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Hosea 6.6 6 says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Were sacrifices necessary for these people back then? Yeah. They were taught. Were they missing the point? Over and over and... Hmm. Are we any better than they are today? Could we be missing the same point? And doing things by ritual instead of by... Heartbreaking? Scribes and rabbis with their punctilious, this is an old word, attention to religious forms, had a sense of want. They knew that rites of penance could never satisfy the soul. Publicans and sinners might pretend to be content with the sensual and earthy, you know, Filling up those, that big void place where Jesus is supposed to be in your life? Fill it up with earthy things. But in their hearts, there was distrust and fear. Jesus looked upon the distressed and heartburden, those whose hopes were blighted and who with earthly joys were seeking to quiet the longing of the soul. And he invited all to find rest in him. Have you found rest in Jesus? I've stood here one week and I said, the way that the political situation in our country is, if I was not looking to Jesus, I was not looking to his timing, his omnipotence, his omniscience, his grace. If I was not looking to Jesus, this time of age would scare me. And the people out there are using this fear that people have because they don't have Jesus living in that big hole in their lives, in their souls. And they're filling it up with other things and they're looking to other people, other men and women for security, for peace, for rest. I'd be a fruitcake. If I thought I had to figure this all out by myself. Fruitcake is also filled with a lot of nuts. Anyway. So Jesus. Mingled with sinners. He mingled with people. Who. Were considered. Low class tacky, uh, strange, weird, uh, wrong theology. <clears throat> oh my, what about immoral? How about the lady at the well? That's pretty immoral. What about Zacchaeus? That's pretty immoral. You steal from people, that's publicans. Yeah, that's pretty immoral. What about undesirables now? I mean, what about people who are considered to be unclean? You know, Peter had a problem with unclean. I mean, you have thousands of years or hundreds of years being taught <clears throat> over and over again that some people are unclean. And yes, God will send you a message. 
like a big sheet dropping down with all kind of nasty stuff in it. Things that we know are unclean in the Bible and we're not supposed to eat. And he says, eat it, Peter. And Peter says, I've never eaten anything like that. That's unclean. I'm not going to eat anything like that. Three times it happens. My girlfriend told me, she said, see, we don't have any rules on what to eat anymore. God showed Peter he could eat alligators if he wanted to. And lizards and rats and mice. And I said, wait, 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 wait. He did have a vision, a dream about this, but let's read it on. Let's get a run and start, and then let's go all the way to the end of that chapter and find out the whole story. And when we got through reading it, she said, I never heard that one before. I never heard about that. I said, just read it for yourself. It's not that hard. It's really pretty easy, and it's very interesting that Peter finally realized I'm not supposed to call any man, any human being, unclean. Because haven't we all sinned and come short of the glory of God? We do not have one that is better than another. Although, in the world, we do. They have classes. All sorts of classes. So now we're on Wednesdays. Mingling wisely. Now I've had it said before, and I've heard it many times, <clears throat> that if the church starts to become worldly or to do things in a worldly manner to impress or to woo the world to them, it doesn't work that way. If the church uses worldly methods out in the world, they fast become part of the world. How in the world do we not become partakers of the world? Having once been a partaker of worldly things and trying to fill that hole, for that's what it is, it's self it's making sure that you take care of self. Self has to be taken care of. Not only is myself, but everything else that I own. It's all about I, me, my. I have to take care of me. I have to take care of I. And I have to take care of mine. All my kids, my grandkids. I have to make sure that the house stays. I have to have this. I have to have that. I have to have an education. Not only I have to have an education, but you have to have an education too. Thus we are caught up. And we will do anything to keep this status quo so that we have and we do not have not. The difference between the haves and the have nots? Pickens County, where we reside, is a big place to learn about haves and have nots because they are the that's what it is. There's hardly anything in the middle in this particular county, but there's lots of haves and there's lots of have-nots. First John 2, 15 through 17. Let's turn there. I like First John. I like John's writings. First John 2, 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that does the will of God abideth forever. Wow. Do you do the will of God? Or does your eye lust after things? Does your pride within you well up? Is the love of the Father in you? For that is the will of the Father. Is love. Love for one another. Love. Not just for one another, but love for Him. 
and his love that can come to you and that you can give to other people. Christ has identified himself with suffering humanity and in the lessons given just prior to his crucifixion, he has plainly specified the work he desires his servants to do. Any neglect on the part of professed Christians of the duty they owe to their brethren is an offense against Christ. Whoa, back up. Any neglect on the part of professed Christians. Oh, did you know that's number three in the Decalogue? Think about it. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. You call yourself a Christian and you do not have Christ living in you and you are not with him being a servant to others, then you have just broke number three big time. I don't care if you use a swear word or not. Those who hide their talents, who refuse to impart their blessings to others, dishonor Christ in the person of his saints. Please read the 25th chapter of Matthew and let all who have instructed before them think whether the words are applicable to them. We need to be filled with the breath and life of Christ that we may be co-workers with him for thousands are unconverted, thousands are dying without hope and without God in the world and thousands are doing horrible things. Why? We're supposed to be a Christian nation. What does that say when politicians say, we're a Christian nation. We don't need anybody in here that's not. What does it say when they say, we're a Christian nation and then they don't do things that are Christ-like? What does that tell everybody else that's looking? And I'm not just talking about the earth and what the nations that are on the globe. But there are heavenly planets with full of created beings that are watching to see what happens to us, what we do. And not only those, but there is one who sees your soul. He sees into your very heart. Mingling wisely. So how would you mingle wisely? I mean, did Israel mingle wisely? <laughs> Gracie's shaking her head. <laughs> Israel had a problem with the way they mingled because they kept looking at what they were doing, those people over there doing. Look what those people over there are doing. They're all having a big time. I see there was Genesis 13, 5, and 19, 12. I believe that's the story of Lot. You know, he got the... Abraham said, Lot, you choose. We want the valley or the mountains? Because we can't stay together. We have too much stuff. The Lord has blessed us greatly. And Lot, looking down in the valley, well, that looks pretty nice. I think I like going to the valley. It's not all hilly and, you know, rocky like the mountains. It's nice and flat, and it would plow real easy. Yeah, I think I'm going this way. Abraham, thank you. But did it do Lot and his family any good to go to the valley? Because they were too close to something. And it sucked them in. What was it? It was Sodom. But were they supposed to witness to Sodom? Yes. They just weren't supposed to become like Sodom. Or love the pleasures that Sodom loved. Because his wife did. When the angels came and pulled them out of the out of Sodom and took them away she looked back with longing in her heart that that's where she wanted to be and God what did I say earlier gave her the desires of her heart and she perished along with them 
turn into a pillar of salt? Wow. Turn into a rock. What about uh, Numbers 25, 1 through 3? Now that's a story. That's a little bit of espionage. Because uh, the Moabite king, he didn't know how he was going to be able to deal with the Israelites. And they said, just send your women over to them. Infiltrated. Because the Moabite women, the Moabites had a really, really raunchy, bad, lusty religion. And they believed in fertility in a hardcore way. And so they came into the camps and they talked everybody into coming to their house for dinner. And instead of being in the world and saying, oh, no, thank you. Let me show you about Yahweh. Let me tell you about Yeshua. Let me show you these things that we have from the God on high. They went, okay, what do I wear? And it got them. So do we have to be careful how we mingle? How we go about being in the world but not of the world? I think about sweet Christy, she goes out with the fellas sometimes. You've got to go to New York. And she said she was giving out literature and someone came up and asked you something. They could tell you were different than everybody else out on the street. You know how they knew? By how the way she dressed. They knew she was different by the way she dressed. And yet, you dress very nicely. I think you have very nice taste. Praise the Lord. But they took her literature and they talked with her. Ah, that's being in the world but not of the world. And thank you, Lord, for Christy who does these things because she follows you. Well, in the midst of a crooked generation, we're on Thursday's lesson, Let's go to Philippians 2, 13 through 5. And Philippians is one of those chapters that I have to hunt up in the New Testament. There it is. Galatians, Philippians 2. Chapter 2 is where it says in verse 5, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Did you notice the word says let and not make or take or we're going to put it there? It says let. Oh, that sounds like a choice to me. Let this mind be in you that's in Christ Jesus. Well, let's look down at verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Ah, the mind of Christ. Is that not God dwelling in us? Do all things without murmuring and disputing, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. First part of verse 16, holding forth the word of life. Holding forth the word of life. You know, Jesus raised people from the dead. He spoke. The word of life. A crooked generation. Boy, howdy. Do I ever feel like sometimes I'm in the middle of a crooked generation? And the lesson said, there's no question the world needs what we have been given in Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me. What we have been given in Christ. 
Have we taken what Christ has given? Have we accepted it? Have we let that mind be in us? Sometimes we're very careful about seeking to protect ourselves from the world that we never come in contact with souls. It is very easy to stay in our own spiritual and theological comfort zone and to become spiritual introverts. I don't know what an introvert is. I've never been an introvert. But I understand that sometimes it can be quite painful because you are afraid. The fear inside you wells up. I get afraid. I get fearful. What happens when we have those feelings of fear and inadequacy and that you can't go on one step further and things are going to turn out terrible and you start doubting and <coughs> what are we supposed to do? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. 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 Did you know in the Bible, every time you see the word grace, you can substitute the word power and it has the same meaning or even sometimes better? Because grace is power. It's power to obey. It's power to persevere. It's power to get down on your knees. Because sometimes we need power to repent. Oh. What happens to us? Do we become like the Pharisees and we don't want to get our clothes dirty? We don't want to become unclean because we're going to a feast. We're going to church. And if we touch this poor man over in the ditch over here, <clears throat> if we help him, if we touch him, we will become unclean. And who knows who he is? He, he might be a Samaritan, a Gentile. He could be a Greek. I don't know what he is. He could be a Roman. I've got to get going. I can't stop. Do we get that way about people? I might get hurt. If I stay around here to help him, I might get hurt. They're, they may be still up here in the, in the hills and they could fall on me. i got to get going. I might get hurt. Or I'm just playing late for something and I can't pull over and help somebody. Or I might get hurt if I pull over and help somebody. Nowadays with a cell phone, you can always call some help. And praise the Lord for a cell phone. Praise the Lord for technology. If you're kicking at the pricks and the, and the goads, go ahead and get you a phone learn how to use it. Go ahead and get a computer and learn how to use it because there is wonderful tools God has put at our disposal. Well... In the lesson, down on the bottom, there's this fellow named Robert Lintkum, L-I-N-T-H-I-C-U-M. <clears throat> he talks about empowering the poor. And I want you to think about empowering the poor and think about the poor in spirit, the poor in finances, the poor in choices, First, the church in the city has virtually no contact with the community. The bulk of the church's emphasis is serving its members' needs. That's the church in the city. Then there is the church to the city. This church knows that it must get involved in ministry to the community. It guesses what the community needs without consulting the community it serves. In other words, it does the programs that it wants to. Then it presents these programs to the community. I added that, by the way. Its ministry risk being 
irrelevant and with no community ownership. Last, this fellow says, he speaks of the church that's with the city. This church does a demographic analysis to understand those whom it serves. Members mingle with leaders and residents of the community, asking them what their real needs are. Their service to the community is more likely to be relevant and well-received because the community has already given input and trusts the process. This church joins the community in their struggle to decide what kind of community they want and is a partner with the community toward realizing that goal. Such a church gets involved with community organizations and may help the community to add lacking services, if needed. There is a mutual ownership and a buy-in of this partnership to meet real needs. Do you know somebody out there that has real needs? Real needs. Poor in spirit? Poor in daily living? Makes poor choices? Is afraid of everyone and everything? Distrust? Do you know somebody like this? Has God put this person in your path more than once? Grace is sufficient for you. Grace is sufficient for you and for this person. Are we afraid to get involved? Are we afraid to get dirty? Are we afraid somebody might hurt us? Are we afraid that other people might go, oh my, this person associates with the lowest of the low. Are we afraid of that? Was that going to soil my reputation? Review and Herald, 1878. August 8th. Review and Herald, August 8, 1878. Whatever sufferings or trials you may be called upon to bear, you should not permit a breath of murmuring to escape your lips. You should reflect that the mastery of heaven endured far more for your sake than it is possible for you to be required to bear. He has redeemed you by his boundless mercy, by his blood and agonies and death. When the master calls you, go to work today in my vineyard, let no selfish desire, no worldly ambition or projects deter you from instant, cheerful, unqualified obedience. The life of the gospel minister Oh, by the way, this is you and me, the gospel minister. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The life of the gospel minister should be a living presentation of the life of Christ, the Christianity that is manifested in the life and character that beams out in divine loveliness from the countenance and from every action. Hmm, the life. This is a power that will attract sinners to the Savior and dispel the dreary shades of doubting and distrust. The corruptions existing in the ministry. There are corruptions in our ministry. There are corruptions in our midst. Have made thousands of infidels. Do you know what an infidel is? It's a demon. When men see the selfishness and sin of the professed teachers of Christianity, and who are professed teachers of Christianity? Those who claim 
Christ as their Savior, who claim to be Christians, to claim to be following after him. When men see the selfishness and sin of the professed teachers of Christianity, they are apt to lose confidence in Christianity itself because they can't see past the person in front of them. Pray. Oh Lord, please forgive us. Please Lord, enlighten us and send us out. Oh Lord, that we would use what you have given us because it all belongs to you. The cross is on every loaf of bread, every fountain of water, every tree, every herb. Dear Lord, we would that you fill us with your spirit, your sweet presence. Give us your grace, that power that enables us to go out and talk to others, even if we're not extroverts, but put people in our pathway that we can minister to because you gave us some blessings to share. Oh Lord, we, we want to share our blessings. Please, Lord, put these people in our daily lives. And then as we pray together and pray for these people, Lord, we would that you would strengthen us moment by moment because we are weak. We have wandering eyes and wandering minds. And we need thee. Oh, how we need thee. And we, we get little glimpses of heaven and we, we want now to share these glimpses with others. And as we do, the blessings will rain down and your spirit will be poured out. Please, Lord, give us the strength to let this mind be in us, this mind of Christ Jesus, so that you may dwell with us that you and Christ may dwell with us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.